Okay, so for our next uh, presentation, um, we have the youngest presenter we've ever had at any of our conferences. And um, I started to see some of his posts, I believe, in energeticforum.com. And he has been on some of the uh, uh, live calls with Eric Dollard, um, I think either asking questions or kind of explaining some of his uh, experiments. And for a while, where's Eric Dollard? Right there. So he's been corresponding with Eric off and on for a while and kind of talking back and forth on some different uh, experiments uh, that he's been doing. And he has uh, you know, somewhat kind of replicated some of uh, Eric's experiments dealing with seismic forecasting. And he's been uh, kind of working with Eric remotely on some uh, three-phase uh, experiments, uh, three-phase electrical experiments. and. Um, He's an experimentalist and researcher of the electrical sciences, and he has a background in uh, mathematics. Uh, he currently attends high school, and I'd like to mention he's 16 years old, and has uh, tested various Tesla-related concepts, most notably Tesla's form of true wireless communication. Uh, he consistently investigates inventions and concepts of the early 20th century and employs them in telecommunications, RF, distribution networks, and related fields. So help me welcome Griffin Brock. This is on electrodynamic seismic forecasting. And with recent work given by Eric Dollard, this is a more simplified approach in that it can be fitted into a suburban area and doesn't really require miles and miles of telephone networks. Such it's not as detailed and not as complex as his system, but this is just a more adapted version. So we start with the background and we begin with a little story in Sichuan, China in 2008. Now during this time, an elementary school physics teacher was going to teach a class, the class, his second grade class, on the basics of magnetism and other principles. Now, during that day, he brought with him some solenoids, some other physical apparatuses, and including a compass. Now, during that time before he was going to give the presentation, he noticed that the compass needle was behaving quite chaotically, that it wasn't aligning with the north and south pole of the Earth. Now, in doing so, he was really bothered by this and feared that something was going terribly wrong, either in the compass or just something around. Now, he eventually demonstrated this to his students, and stated that he doesn't know what's happening, what's going on, but something is going to prevail. And sure enough, about 13 minutes later, a terrible 8.0 magnitude earthquake occurred in that region. Now, it's said that it occurred within the mountaintops, but it created a devastating aftermath. Now, this is actually the elementary school where everything was happening. Even uh, The teacher even went outside to see if this was any interference coming from inside, but nevertheless, the compass was still spinning and behaving quite odd. And this is likely to come from the current and great magnitude of the magnetic conditions within that area prior to the quake, and at that time reached significant levels which was able to be demonstrated via the compass. Now, in dealing with precursors and other seismic anomalies, we come to the condition of earthquake lights. Now, these are inevitably chased by UFO hunters and other conspiracy theorists alike. But earthquake lights such as this are, seem to originate near the epicenter of a major earthquake, usually a couple hours or even days prior to one. Now, in this case, this was photographed in 1972, and pr after that, a few hours later, actually about a week or so, a major earthquake of a 7.3 magnitude occurred within the Alaska range. Now, this photograph details the outlines of these orbs. These, uh, not much is known on them, but from demonstrations and other witnesses, they say that they are glowing orbs of unknown size. It's maybe about the size of basketball or so. It's really unexplainable, and they tend to float around near these epicenters. Now, one could only conclude that these are aliens or other unexplained phenomena, but taking into consideration the great electrical magnitude prior to a massive quake like this, we can say that there's some type of unexplained electrical phenomenon making these lights occur. 
Now, this one occurred in Tagish Lake Yukon, ter Yukon Territory, and there are many other ones like this that have occurred throughout history. Not too much is known, but hopefully sooner or later some light could be shed on this. Now, this is an overall planetary scale distribution of these currents which originate in the Earth, and these currents are inevitably the dri one of the driving force or possibly a byproduct of the, of the seismic activity, but it's likely one of the driving forces. Now, this scale uh, distribution diagram demonstrates and shows the actual circulatory currents that flow within the Earth. Now, this one was made in 1936 or so, so the, it's not, not entirely enough information, but it's still a, 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 how should I say, a decent diagram representing of what's going on. Now, of course, these currents are flowing everywhere throughout the Earth. It's mainly, it's a sea of them, and they can be originated either within the inner core of the Earth or, as some theorists have said, that is a, is a result of the Earth's magnetic field inducing a current within the Earth, but that doesn't seem to add up in most explanations. Here, we have a measuring device, maybe a galvanometer, and then a battery, and then two plates. But in this case, we'll ignore the battery and only focus on the galvanometer or measuring device in question. So here, we can see that using something such as two plates, we could measure the intensity of the electrostatic potential or telluric current with, or that flow within the Earth. Now, the distance between these two plates could vary, ideally thousands of feet apart or even miles, so that to actually determine the great magnitude of a precursor prior to a major earthquake within a local area and measure any anomalies. Now, given that the closeness of the separation, it doesn't give enough experimentation and value to really measure what's going on down under. Now, in this case, Stubblefield demonstrates his wireless apparatus, his wireless telephony, using two mirror, two mirror ground rods of steel, primarily steel, that they're fixated in a sword-like fashion, and these are separated about 10 meters away. And you have a transmitter, a carbon microphone transmitter, that is powered by a battery and then inevitably goes to a induction coil, a telephone induction coil. Yet little is known on his setup and the rest is history. He never wrote in the books nor really patented this method of transmission. But we could see from diagrams and other witnesses that it was two, using two ground rods and apparently he modulated these earth currents that flowed within the earth and created a audio transmission. Now the telluric setup that I've devised is quite simple to the van method and that I use two ground rods that are both 10 feet long, copper, hollow rods, and they're separated 315 feet apart. Now this is using military telephone wire from Vietnam. I have about 2,000 feet of it in a large spool, but it's quite abundant, so it makes it ideal for projects like these, this. And then this is the direction in which it lies. So we have the rod A facing the north direction, and conveniently, the uh, rod B is facing the south direction. And as determined in prior examples, we see that there's a flow of energy between the south, uh, from south to north, and that that's where the greatest energy measurements could be made. And this is an electrical buildup, taking some more close attention to it. We see that it takes a few days, and then eventually it breaks, the earthquake occurs. And then after that, a whole bunch of them happened. But this is the main point of interest. Now, in other more sensitive setups, this could be seen for about a week. But in this case, I mean, sorry, a few weeks or even to a month, as the van method had proven. But in this case, it's just roughly a week. But we could still see that buildup. And here's another significant buildup that we see that the 7.4 in Mexico, that was a 3.75 volt buildup. And then here is the magnetos magne yeah, sorry, magnetosphere that was disturbed prior, on the, uh, prior to the Mexican earthquake on the 23rd, actually on the day of the earthquake, but it was on the 23rd of June. Now we could see that there is a disturbance within the Earth's magnetic field, and this is from measure a magnetometer measurements from different parts around the globe. 
but it was an anomaly that shocked scientists because it took on a almost sine wave pattern, but it was definitely a reminiscent sign of the solar activity, or as they like to say, a whisper from the sun.